Okay. Is it Anison? Yeah. Well, my name is uh, Anita Kwame, and I'm so happy to work with uh, software design in Equinor. It's a huge energy solution company with its headquarters in Norway. And there I'm allowed to do DDD together with BDD to build event source application. I mean, I am, as Scott Hanselman probably would say, I'm living the dream, at least my work life dream, building those event source applications. And I wonder, is there any one of you living your dream, work life dream, building event source application? Hands up. Oh, yeah, some. Anyone building event source application, living your nightmare? <laughs> okay. At least not so many hands on that, that's good. Okay, I promise you some real life experience and that is what I will give you. But since I'm not allowed to tell you all the secrets from the business I'm working with, I have made up a dummy application. Welcome to my automation wall. And I will just use this application to communicate this experience. And when we have made this application or the real ones, we had some drivers. I'm working in a company that wants to be more and more data-driven, as a lot of companies do these days. And digitalization and automation is high on our agenda. And we have applications with multiple bonded contexts, and we use external services, so we need to understand the challenges with distributed solutions. In this application, the control center are serving the front end, and it has an aggr aggregate related to digital strategies, starting and stopping this. And it's two different aggregates that is related to two different business area. One is office cleaner planner, and the other take care of canteen stuff. And now when they serve different food to get it as cheap and as good quality as possible. And then we have the algo handler that execute on these digital strategies by starting and stopping algos on external services. Before I start with my experience, I want to introduce you for you four building blocks that I pick up from a talk from Sebastian von Conrad, and I find them very useful to communicate the different uh, experience we have. The first one is writing with command. The user do something and that intention is captured in a command, and that command has to do something to something, and that something is the aggregate. And the result of that is one or more events and an updated aggregate state. This building block is deterministic. So is the next one. Reading by queries or read models, that I would call it, because that's what it's called in event storming. And that's the name that we use in our team. Here you have an event. It's projected to a read model state. And you get a new read model state. And then you have the third building block that I think we talked too less about in the event source community, and that's the cool one. It's the reactors. You can say if the write with command handles client commands and read models handle client reads, well, the reactors take care of all the rest. It takes care of all these rules. Whenever this happens, that should happen. And the result of it could be that you have some new events with an updated aggregate state, and it's also responsible for doing the side effects calling APIs on that stuff. And the fourth building block is, is Event Store. And we use Cosmos DB in Azure as our Event Store. So the thinking here, you just take these building blocks like Lego bricks and you assemble them to build your Event Source application. And that's the mindset in my team when we are building our Event Source applications. We do DDD. And I have done that before I started to do event sourcing, and I really love doing DDD, so domain model is important. And when you do domain modeling, it's all about exploiting the concept from the business to build a model that you use to solve the problem. So a domain model is an abstraction, as all models are. It should be fit for the problem it's solving. And you need to use the language of the business. And it should re reflect both the concept and the behavior. And really, really important, it should be, should be exploited in code. It has to be in the code, using it to solve our problems. And it will be evolving. 
So this domain model, we create that together with the business. We need to work together with the business in order to understand the problem we are solving. And of course, we love event storming and we use it. And event storming is the perfect starting point, mainly because you can work on different level, if you ask me. So we do some high levels event storming session with the business, but where we actually use the most of the time is on design level event storming in our team, outline all the commands, what events should it lead to, what building block are we thinking about. And when we are thinking about understanding the problem and we have understood it, we need to figure out how should we solve it or where. And here I think my toolbox is better when I do event source application than what I had before, because the different building blocks can actually take care of different building ru no, business rules. Writing with command, well, that won't take care of all the invariants, all the rules that need to be true when data is at rest and validation. The reactors do the same, but it in addition is all, have all these rules. Whenever this happens, that should happen. And it performs the side effects. And the read model, it's so easy to think that the read model is not the business rules. It can be a lot of business rules on the read model. What if we want to have a report, estimate cost for each person in the canteen? There is a lot of rules for actually extracting that from the events. So domain modeling, we focus on the aggregate, the events and the read models. Uh, for the aggregate, it only has to handle the right side. And that is something I really, really like. Because all the time when I've been working with read models in non-event source solution, I think there is a struggle to find the needs of the read side and the right side and make it fit perfect together. It's like in my marriage, when we need to take care of my needs and my husband's needs, it's so hard to find the optimal solution. And now in the event sourcing world, the aggregate only needs to take care of the right side rules which make it simpler. It's solving a simple, a simpler problem. And then you have all the domain event. And I say domain event, not event, because my DDD heart is with me, what I do when we do event sourcing. So I want to ha have domain event. That is something that will happen that the business cares about. And I have a goal when I'm doing architecting the solution. I want to architect for tomorrow's question. That is important in a data-driven organization. Someone will and should ask a new question tomorrow. And that means that we go for domain event with all the details, a lot of details, so we can actually answer those questions from tomorrow. And we have chosen to use domain concept into our domain events. I know a lot of people say that you can use pri primitives, it's easier when they are changing. But again, my DDD heart say, domain events is part of your domain model. You have to use domain concept, and that's the approach we have taken. Read models. As I said, you have a domain model here that needs to be fit for the calculation, for instance, you are doing. And in addition, you are part of it, that read model that is actually communicating up to the users in the user interface. And there we use the backend for frontend pattern. And then we cooperate with the UX person in order to understand the user needs to make the correct read models. So I think domain modeling, each part is easier, but then you have the really hard part, naming. And naming has all of a sudden become even harder than before. In our first application, we were really focusing on that the aggregate sh should be simple and fit for the purpose to solve, but the events should have all these details. So we ended up with strategy configuration on the aggregate and strategy configuration details on the domain events. And that wasn't such a good idea. So in our second application, we didn't take that part with us and we started to share the concept. But just to make it clear, is a lot of the concepts that are, are in the domain event that is not used in the aggregate. And it's a lot of the concepts that are in the aggregate that is not used in the domain event. It's just in the cases where the aggregate only needed four of the nine properties that we see 
it makes it even simpler just to share those concepts. When it comes to the read models, here we favor independency of the read model, so we don't want it to be coupled to the right side, so we try to, to have different concepts, and usually the, what you are showing to a user is a bit different anyway, and it's often a kind of summary, so we have a lot of summaries, and that isn't the best solution, but it's the best we have come up with, but I'm sure it has to be a better pattern out there. So if you know it, please let me know, because this one is a bit, yeah, I don't know. In our team, some of us have started to discuss if it should be a separate bonded context, but so far we have decided not to go for that approach. So, to summarize, shaping the domain model is important for us, and all in all, even though the naming is harder, we, I think the overall it is easier. But it's easier, it isn't easy. Domain modeling is always challenging, not easy, just a bit easier. So we in our team need a friend to shape and reshape our domain model, and our friend is behavior-driven development. I've used this one before, I started to do event sourcing too, and I really like it. And what I like with it is that you can pick some requirements and you can write scenarios that are about those requirements. And you write the scenarios on a given when then format. So given is what have happened up to now, it set the scene. When is what is happening and then is the result. So when you do that and you implement it, then you shape your domain model and then you pick some new requirements make some new scenarios, and you reshape your domain model. So it's this iterative process that our BDD scenarios help us with. So let's take an example. And this is a simple example, but we really try to start out this simple if we are working with uh, some new areas, and then we add on more details. The good thing with event sourcing is all of a sudden, what have happened is always a sequence of domain events. So the given is always this list of domain events and some details related to the command. The when, that is just when running the, the uh, command. So that's the easy part of writing the test. And then, well, you look at the result. In this case, we have a strategy started event. So we test on the new domain events. And of course, we had new scenarios with a lot of more details. And we could have stopped here and still have got a lot of automatically test support because the domain events is the only thing that we save. And even though I love our BDD tests that we implement and they are our automatically test support, I love that them give me the safety net. It is just as important that these tests should shape and reshape our domain models. So we also need to add the aggregate. So we put it all into our scenarios. And here you see, we have some concept. We, use, we work a bit with the wordings of these scenarios, and then these concepts are mirrored directly into our domain model. We do use C Sharp, so this is a strategy defined, is a class in our C Sharp code. So we have the concept directly from the test, but what about the behavior? Our domain model should have both. Well, the behavior part is what we need to add as functionality in order to be able to go from the given to the then. So indirectly, these tests also shape that part. So writing with commands could be summarized like this. But we wanted also to how feature tests for our reactors. And that was new for us. So we started out with some separate feature tests just for the rule, whenever this happened, that should happen. And then we added a separate test for the writing side business rules. But it felt like a lot of mocking. First, I had to mock the event to see that the reactor gave me the right command. And then I had to mock that command just to take the next step. So what we agree was to try to do more in one go. And that was really easy, technically. So it was easy and the upside was clear. It was less mocking and less work. And for us, this was a quite 
long story, we were struggling a bit with the scope of the test, but uh, to make this uh, story a bit shorter here today, what we have ended up with is that we have all, everything that is inside one bonded context is the scope of our feature test, and that could include a set of internal reactors. And then we need to test on all the events and all the um, aggregates. But even though we, the scope is bigger, we don't want our scenarios to be really big. So we separate out the scenarios. So our scenarios typical are focusing on one aggregate and the events related to that aggregate. So we get just as many scenarios, but much less mocking. And then we have the read side business rules. For the read side, that is also deterministic. I didn't say that, it is, but of course also for writing with commands, since it's deterministic, it is so good for this kind of test. But for the read side, when you have a list of domain events that has already happened, if you project a new one, well, then the results should be the same every time. And that's why it's so good for this automatically testing. And we heard earlier today in the first uh, talk that testing is really important and easy to do, kind of, or one reason to do event sourcing. And doing this feature test, I think it worked very well for us to have a good test coverage. Yeah. So we do this on the read side, and BDD is also our friend there. So to summarize, BDD is useful, just as useful as before. And we have struggled with the scope, but that is just because it was new for us. And now I think we are in a place that we have figured it out. But at least the usefulness has been there all the time. And I recommend to look into BDD when doing event sourcing applications. Okay, I want to talk more about reactors, because I think really the reactors is this amazing building block, but they also are quite challenging. And I think the reason for that is because it helps us to solve some challenging issues, not related to event sourcing, but actually related to building distributed solution. So let's take a scenario. We have writing with command, so the user starts a strategy, so you get a strategy started event. And then you have a reactor to listen to this one and uh, create a new event. So this reactor doesn't do a side effect. So if you look at the one part of the reactor and writing with command, it seems really similar. It's only difference is how they actually are uh, the command is created, that one is based on the user and the other is uh, based on reacting to an event. But still, even though they are similar, we need to pay attention because they are a bit different on some areas. One thing is error handling. Error handling for writing with command is really easy because it's just what we have done always. We have a user out there that we can give the error message to. But how should we think about error handling when it happens in the reactor? Well, who should take the corrective action? Whenever we have an error that is related to a business rule, we try to make that as a first class citizens of our domain model, meaning we try to express it as a domain event. And that by us option, we can have our read model listen to it and by that showing it to the user. So indirectly, we can show it to the user or we can have a reactor listening to it and try to do some corrective action. But then that is OK for those, uh, those errors that is related to business rules. But what about those errors that is supposed never to happen? Null pointer exception being the worst of them all. We never put a null pointer exception detected uh, event. That isn't a domain event. So what we actually do in this case, and this is the scariest thing we do in our application, we, oh, sorry, we throw an error. And let's assume we have a bug. The reactor will react to the same event again. And since there is a bug in the solution, if we throw a new error, it actually gets stuck there. So why do we do that? We know it will get stuck. Well, it is because we can't expect 
to skip one event, but believe that the next event that get into the sequence actually will work. And what we're afraid of is that we might skip one event, and the next one might go OK, and the next one after there, get a new error due to the first one, and we get into a corner where we get a lot of data issues we are not able to recover from. And that's why we have taken this approach. But it is a dilemma. Should you actually do that, or should you try to just skip all those events in that sequence, for instance? You can put a lot of effort into this. But after all, these are things that never are supposed to happen. So how much effort should we actually put into it? So this is the strategy we have now. We have experimented it once. It was on configuration that was incorrect in our production environment. And the reactor got stuck, but we fixed it fairly quickly. And we still have that strategy of throwing those errors. But it's, it is scary. But on the other side, it's also scary to get into a lot of data issues you don't know if you actually are able to recover from. Because then it could take a very long time to fix a bug, because you also need to fix the data issues. The way we do it, we just need to fix the bug. And then the reactor will restart on the same event, and everything will work as expected. At least it did in the one experience we have here. OK, the other thing that we pay attention to is duplicate handling. And the reason for this is that uh, our change feed, that that's a part of Cosmos DB. So it's something we get for free, kind of, when we use Cosmos DB. It has at least once delivery. That has been mentioned at least once before here today, because it makes things harder. And therefore, our aggregates need to be able to detect duplicates, and it needs to be able to correct duplicates. And the strange thing here is that this at least once delivery, that's a technical uh, thingy. But the approach we have taken is more to understand the business. So if the aggregate already knows it's algo enabled, well, then it doesn't emit the new event. So I wouldn't say that detecting and handling those duplicates is really hard. At least for us, it is fairly easy. We understand the business good enough to know the rules, but we need to remember it. So we need to help each other out in the team. So we never forget it for one of our uh, reactors. And here also BDD is our friend, because instead of we say when running the command, we just say when running the command once or twice, and then you run that scenario two times, one with just the command once, and one with two to, to kind of uh, uh, simulate that you get a duplicate. And since the result should be the same, that's all we need to do in order to get this test support. And that's pretty nice. OK, so I would say error handling and duplicate is, is work, and we need to pay attention to it. But the really hard part, it comes when you, your re reactor should do side effects too. So let's assume that we have a reactor in our algo handler context that are uh, reacting to this uh, food plan algo enabled event. And it should both ca call an API to request to start an algo. And it should save a domain event. And then we got into a situation that is often called you are right or the true right problem. Because we want to do two things. And we want it to succeed or fail. But of course, this is not something you can put into one transaction. And here we have some alternatives. Some of those alternatives is just to get rid of the dual rights challenge with uh, avoiding it. And um, we have discussed a lot in our team around this. So one alternative that we were discussing is to only do the side effect and not save the event. But of course, then the aggregate doesn't have an event that are telling you what have been done, but you avoid to have a dual right. So you get rid of that challenge. Another alternative, and reactors is great. They are so flexible. So we could have two reactors listen to the same event. And one of those could do the API call, and the others could save the events. But of course, if you are high load on our solution, what if the one reactor lag behind and you, it has 
done 88 calls to the API. We'd already saved 100 domain events, saying that it has done it 100 times. So this has its own site too. And then we could also have two reactors in uh, the sequence. And that is a very good option, but at the same time, it adds some extra delay than uh, compared to only having one or two in parallel. So it's not an option we have taken. So for one of our uh, scenarios, starting an algo instance, we had have struggled a bit. So we started out in our team and discussing a lot when we were doing this because it was the first real dual write and how should we do it? And we have read the theory, so we know it's hard. And we said, okay, we only call the API, we don't save the event. But then someone say, yeah, but can't we just save the event? But if it fails, we don't need to throw an error so we get the loop that it's called once more. We can, but still, in 90% or 99%, it will be there and it will be helping us in IT. So yeah, we went for that option. Of course, that isn't a good option, even though we said nobody should rely on this event because we can't be sure. Those agreements tend to be forgotten. And in some refactoring later, we are throwing if the save doesn't work. And we had in dev, we had scaled down on a database for testing something else. And then we actually got some issue we believe was related to this. Because if you're doing dual write, the golden rule is that you should make sure that step one is idempotent. And of course, our API to the external service, they didn't give us idempotent API. So we could not relay on calling it many times and it wouldn't have any bad effects. So we ended up with switching those two steps because saving of events, we keep it our, we handle it ourselves. So we can make it unimportant, and we did. And then we call the API. So in a way, we managed to follow the rules, but there is more complexity to it than that. Because since we have at least once delivery, and even if we are going for don't having the dual write issue, when you have at least once delivery and you have uh, need to call an API that is not idempotent, well, then you have an issue because you can't be completely sure that uh, everything are uh, correct. So what we are working with in my team is to think about self-healing. It's a concept we are talking about a lot. And in those cases, we know it's just so much you can do. Some of you might have heard about this two genera problem that you kind of in a distributed solution to be completely, completely sure it's really hard. So we add an extra layer. It could be triggered by a timer or it could be that we react to a domain event. And what it does, it tries to detect the solution uh, situation and fix it. So the application is fixing it, not calling IT support. And for the case of starting the algo instance, it is just to check if two instances are running, then we stop one of those. So it is quite simple actually, but you need to have this extra layer of, of uh, checking. But it helps us a lot to think about this self-healing stuff. Okay. I don't know if anyone of you have noticed it, but when I have been talking now, I have been talking around the anti-pattern because what is an internal event in one of our bonded contexts, we actually use as an external event in the other bonded context or an outside event. And we only use it in the anti-corruption layer, but it still is an anti-pattern. So don't do, go home and do this, at least not say I told you to, because you shouldn't. Or the truth is that we own both the bonded context. So we are a, a fairly small team working really closely together. And by not having this outside event as an integration event, we get rid of some complexity. And we are a team too that try to learn us all these patterns. So we have said, okay, for now, we don't do this outside event, but at any point when we need it, we can just put an extra reactor there and we can add it. 
But as I said, we'll never ever have done this if it wasn't for that we own the both con bonded context and it's both part of the same solution. So what we get is a more common pattern with less complexity because that we got rid of this um, extra outside event. Reactors also pro provide flexibility. You can let a lot of reactors listen to the same event. We got fairly late. We got a requirement that each we had to run multiple processes. Again, it was a requirement with the external uh, service. We couldn't get around it. And it was just a user that had started the strategy, just that needed to have its separate process and stuff. But the point was, it was so easy to fix it. We just spin up a lot of processes, all get all the events, and it pick out the events they need to react on. We can also scale out or to send different events to different um, reactors. And here, Cosmos DB do a great job, so we can manage that all events to the same, from the same stream go to the same reactor. But the flexibility is the clue here, because as an architect, it's so easier that you know that you have that flexibility. You don't need to use it from day one, but just to have the possibility later, as we did for when we needed multiple processes. So I think that reactors, it helps us with the having distributed solution and the really hard problem with this dual right. And it also helps us to be modular and have a good pattern for being modular inside a bonded context. So all aggregates when they communicate is through events and reactors. And it also is kind of the same patterns between the bonded context. And if we should have produced an outside event for an other solution, of course, then we would have added a reactor. We would never have sent our inside event, but then you can just add a new reactor. So reactor is my favorite building blocks. OK, we should talk a bit more about real models, because I like them too. I like everything with event sourcing, but you might have figured out that by now. So in-memory read models. Since uh, the, the read models is just a projecting of every event in the stream, if you re every time you restart your application, you start from the first event, you can actually have those read models in your memory. You don't need to save them at, uh, to a, whatever database you want to use. And we use in-memory read models a lot. One thing is that early phase, I think, read models tend to change a lot because users, when they see something in the screen, then they, they understand what actually data they want to look at. So you get a lot of more changes there than what you do for the events. Uh, so here, having it in memory is kind of speed up the delivery t t uh, time for that, those changes. And since it's in memory, it's also very fast when the cli client asks for some information. So we have in-memory read models in production, but we also have places where we started out, but then when the stream become too long, that it was a bit issue when you restart the application, it took a bit too long time to actually project all those events. Well, then we just changed and started to save it. So this is also something I like as an architect. I can start with the in-memory stuff, and then it's quite easy to go on and save the read models instead. Also here, we have this error handling and duplicate handling that we need to pay attention to. But we have quite different strategies than what we have for the reactors. For instance, if we get an error in this case, we do skip the event, we log it, so it appears on the monitors uh, in IT, so we can investigate the issue, but we skip the event and take the next one. So we are thinking a bit different. We think, OK, it's better that not the whole remote are, are delayed, even though a part of them will be a bit incorrect. And we are internal users, so we can tell them that there is an issue with this and what area it is. And we are not afraid that we will get into a corner that we are not able to recover from. Because even though if we have the read model in the database, we can at any point in time uh, delete that. And when we have fixed the issue, because I should have said that, 
errors in a read model. It's never because the user tried to do something it's not allowed to do. So it's not business rules. It's always a bug or any that, that kind of errors because the business rules is guarded on the right side. So if we get an issue like this, we have to fix something and then we can replay from the first event. So this fear of getting in a data issue that we are not able to fix isn't relevant at all. And also for duplicate handling, we have taken a more technical approach here. We just have a list of all the domain events that it has been projected and save that in the same transaction as we say with our read models. And that will help us with the duplicates. And then our read models are eventually consistent, as you probably would expect. But when I read on the big, big internet about this, it feels like it's such a huge issue. Those read models are eventually consistent. And I have a background from some really, really huge database on some monolith applications that was the best in class when it comes to two-phase commit, and everything was strong consistent. And I had the pleasure to have a walkthrough with a lot of users of that solution just to understand how they were using it. And one of them told me something that has stick to my mind. She said to me, when I'm looking at the information in this table, I know if an other user changes it, I have to refresh just that screen. And then she said, but in this screen, if anyone has changed the information I'm looking at here, I have to remember to close the screen and open it again, and I will see the information. And then she had a third screen and said, if the information in that screen has been changed, I have to close the complete application and restart it, and I will see those changes. So yeah, that database was consistent, but did that actually help our users? My V, our eventual consistent, user interface is uh, read models is even better because the good thing with projection and read models that I like so much is that when, when I projected an event into a read model, that read model, now I have been updated now and it know what part that has been updated. So it's a perfect fit for near real-time user interfaces that you, where you can push out the changes to the user. And this is what we are working against to get as near real time as possible. And the user should not need to do refresh and at least not knowing when to do it and in what kind of situation you have to do different refresh. So I want to challenge that. I think a lot of read models, even they are a bit uh, not strong consistency, have some properties that is better than in the old world. Okay, so how do we correct data issues? And here I'm not thinking about data issues when the user does a mistake, because if the user do a mistake, it needs to have a corrective uh, action. And it's like in accounting, and I'm sure you all know about this. So for us, if the user start on strategy and didn't intend to, well, then it stop it. And that is kind of the corrective action. But what if we have data issues? That is the reason for bugging our solution. I'm sure you don't put bugs in your solution, but it actually happened to us. But before I go into this, uh, what we have done here, I want to tell a story because I was at a hotel some weeks ago and there was a couple discussing with some friends, it seems like, and they said, we are having diamond wedding next week. And our children have started to ask us, what's the secret? How do, uh, how do you manage to get, uh, stay married for so long? And the wife said, I have told them the secret. It is to have a very, very short memory. And, I th and it struck me that this short memory strategy, that's what we have done for our SQL application for years. If you have an issue, we run a SQL script and I have a vague recollection that there should be a log someplace, but there is no traces in the real solution. And in our event source solution, we also have some possibilities for doing this short memory strategies. And one of those is that we could just go into Cosmos DB and fix it. And that is so attempting. Because we use Cosmos DB, so it isn't an event store that 
uh, prevent us from doing it, but of course we understand we can't do that. And the reason is that it will lose it, it, the number in the sequence of the events, so all read models and so on will get really varied. So we don't do that, a sad face. But we have also a possibility to do migration, and that is something we have done. We, once we had a typo in the user interface, and this typo has come all the way down to our events. And we were like, uh, it isn't really important for us to remember that this has happened, that we had this typo. And then we actually do, did our migration and we fixed the issue and we have a trace in place, but it's no real trace in the application. So back to the real life, what if you go to Las Vegas and you get married and you wake up the next day and you regret it? I guess you can use the short memory strategy there too. Just try to forget it. But then, five years later, you meet the man and woman in your life and you really want to get married. And what happened? There it is, the invariant rule, the business rule, blowing up in your face saying you are not allowed to be married to two persons at a given time. So probably you should have taken a more corrective action, file for annulment or something, and get uh, it annulled. So some compensating event, because that's the safest. And that is also the thing that we, we think is safest in our event source application when we need to fix an issue. To be honest, we don't have a lot of uh, experience here, and that's a good thing, of course, because it means we haven't had a lot of data issue. It might be because of this, uh, that we are really concerned about those reactors, I don't know. But we have had issues, and once we actually added some more functionality in the user interface so the user could uh, fix those data issues, and then we got the compensating events, and those compensating events is then the part of the true story that your event stream is telling, and that is the way we like to correct those kind of issues. I guess you also can use a script to add those compensating events, but then of course you have to take care that those events do apply to all the invariant rules, because if you don't do it through your aggregates, you need to guard those rules self. We haven't done that because we haven't needed. Okay, migration of domain event. This was also something we were thinking about. These events, I heard that they are changing, and even though I'm so glad I don't need to ever m migrate my read models anymore and change the SQL schema for those, we still have the pain point of the events. And we were sitting there, the whole team, and looking at a talk by Greg Young, where he outlined a lot of different possibilities. You can upcase your events, and you can do this and that. And we said, we go for migration. And the migration part is that you take your whole event stream, you start from the first event, you read it up in our homemade migration tool, and we convert it if we should do a change to it. If not, we do nothing to it, just write it as the first event in the new event store. And when we have done that for the all event in the stream, well, then it, we, we have a new event store with the migrated events. The upside of this is that we don't need to have different versions of our events. So it's in a way really easy, and we ha are allowed to have some downtime because we have some time slots that users are not using the solution, so that is okay for us. And this migration is not typical something we do because we have data issue. It's actually typical something we do and that we try to do often because it means that we have learned something, we have got better insight into our domain model. And when we get this better and deeper insight, we refactor our, uh, our domain concept. And if one of those domain concepts is used in the event, well, then we have to do the migration. And it's a bit time consuming, not hard, but time consuming. We try to do it of more often, so we are not afraid of doing this refactoring to be better at doing it fast. So here, this is a bit of the consequence of uh, me needing to have the domain concept into our events, but even if you have primitives, if you need to add more information into your event, you will have the same issue. 
But if you only refactor without any changes, of course, you wouldn't have it. But migrating those events, if the stream is really, really long, then it takes some time to run the migration. But it doesn't add a lot of dumb time to the application, because what we do is that we start this migration, and when the whole stream is migrated to the new database, first at that point we take down the old version of or the running version of the application. And then we check that the last event has been migrated in case it come, came an event, the last millisecond or something. And then we can just release the new version. So it takes time, but it doesn't take a lot of dumb time of the application. I think event sourcing makes it easier to extend the solution. For us, when we had done the first, uh, the first part of this uh, canteen rules, we were going to the office rules and having digital strategies for that. And then for the strategy aggregate, we just needed to add some new events. But, for, uh, but we also needed to add a new aggregate. And this, that you have those possibilities and that you can extend it much more than update it, I think is really, really important. And I think event sourcing helps us to do that. We can add new building blocks without messing up what is already there. And this is a bit related to how do we see the big picture? We don't do orchestration or process manager and so on. We just have all those events flying around. And we use our design level event storming diagram to see this big picture. And you could say that's, that's documentation. That is out of sync. And of course it becomes. But we use it so much in our team. So every time we need to discuss an area, it's really easy to extract that information from the code because it's not those details that are changing. If you have a new event, so it's easy to update those diagrams. Might be one day I can write something that uh, makes them from the code too. So event sourcing, it is a complex arrangement. And there's no way around it. But it's really, really in important. And this was also something Sebastian von Con Conrad said that I've been thinking about a lot. And I think it's really the clue for having a solution that can be growing without being a mess, that the arrangement should be of simple parts. This means that each building blocks cannot kind of blow up and be bigger and bigger and bigger. We have to take care that each part, because we don't want to get into a situation of complex arrangement of complex stuff. I guess that is on your road to a distributed monolith. So we take really care of this. And I think the clue here is to go back to the building blocks I started this talk with and to think about the patterns. They are really simple and they have to stay simple. And those times when we have struggled a bit, it is when we believe that we should expand something and we realize that it was two different things. So if you wonder, is this the same event or is it actually two different events? It probably is two, two different events and you should extend your solution instead. Okay, I'm approaching the end now, but I want to end with some comments related to digitalization and event sourcing. I think when you do digitalization, automation is important. And here the reactors, it is the building block from heaven. I mean, it helps us so much. It helps us with this. Whenever this happens, that should happen. And then you have to be data-driven. Our rich domain events, what those help us with is to capture all this information without making the rest of the application too complex. And in Equinor, yeah, we want digitalization, we want automation, but just as important is it to empower our users. The user should be on top of things. And here is the read models with a near real-time user interface, a perfect fit. And in the last application I'm working on now, it is like I'm thinking, how should I solve this if, I, if we haven't done event sourcing? And I feel, I don't know. And I take that as a sign that for just the problem we are solving, event sourcing is a good fit because event sourcing isn't a good fit for everything that we know that but for that part. So my personal bet is that in my company, I will be able to continue building event source application, continue living my work life dream, just because I think a lot of the digital 
is an initiative that is happening in my company actually will be a good fit for an event source solution. And by that, I thank you for listening, and it's finally evening. <laughs>